Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel. You are joining me in a different location in the house today. Um, we are actually in my home office. So here we are in a different location. Um, so I wanted to come to you on Sunday today to talk about all of the latest royal stories that come out. Normally, as you know, if you're a royal watcher, lots of newspapers save their big juicy stories for the weekend if they can. Uh, and this week is, is no exception. We do have leaks probably coming out from the palace we're going to get into it apparently charles does has expressed a wish that he wants harry and Meghan to attend the coronation so we'll talk about that in a moment we'll also talk about that incredibly strange revelation that prince andrew made in the week about saying that something was going to come out in february in early february that was going to almost exonerate him or you know change people's opinion of him um, and we think that that thing has come out early and it's a shocker. It's an absolute shocker. So I thought I would come on and do a pre-recorded chat rather than a live one because I can actually show you, I can insert the, the um, pictures that I want you to see. So it, there'll be lots of inserts and things going on. I do much prefer a live chat. I like to talk to people rather than doing a pre-recorded. For me, it feels a little bit weird, you know, just talking to a camera without any interaction. I much prefer having a kind of a conversation. But anyway, let's, enough about me and what I prefer, let's get straight into the royal stories. So apparently King Charles wants Harry to attend his coronation. The King has asked Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, to broker a deal, allowing the Duke and Meghan to be at the ceremony. But William apparently fears his brother will use the event to stage a stunt. Uh, as the monarch mulls over, giving his own TV interview. Okay, so just from the headline alone, we have a few things to dissect. So first of all, um, it's it looks weird from the outside to kind of to be using the Archbishop of Canterbury to be brokering any kind of deal between family members. But this in the royal family has been going on for generations and generations, hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, it's. The monarch has often turned to the clergy for advice uh, and guidance. And often, you know, the clergy have, have traditionally uh, got involved in family matters. So it may seem strange, it may seem a little bit unusual, but actually it's not. It's fairly traditional um, for King Charles, the head of the Church of England, to turn to uh, one of his highest uh, officiants within the clergy. So, yeah, what Justin Welby actually makes of all this, one only can begin to wonder. But anyway, apparently this has come out. I, I imagine that this does have elements of truth to it. As we know from Harry's book, leaks happen to the press. A lot, a lot of time the, uh, the, the journalists uh, have, have their fingers and their ears uh, to royal sources, shall we say. And apparently they've come out to say uh, that, the, that the king wants Harry and Meghan to be there, but needs to kind of broker this deal. And it sort of kind of shows that William fears his brother will use the event to stage a stunt. So there is suspicion there. And that's one thing that I've been saying for a long time. Uh, well, ever since Harry kind of started, I suppose, um, talking to the media about his family, probably since Oprah, um, and definitely with the book, I have said that it's not going to lead to improved relations. And what, what it clearly shows is that suspicions are running high. The royal family don't know what Harry and Meghan are going to do. What kind of stunt could they stage? Um, I think further down in the article, it talks about perhaps uh, the royal family are worried that Harry and Meghan might use uh, the timing of the event around the actual coronation to maybe visit, you know, charities and, you know, maybe disadvantaged areas and maybe that could take away from the coronation. Not that I have anything um, against visiting disadvantaged areas. King Charles himself with the Prince's Trust has championed uh, disadvantaged youth ever since he, ever since the inception of the Prince's Trust. That's what it was set up to do. Uh, but doing things that could be very high profile at that time, especially that could be seen to undermine such an ostentatious occasion, uh, such a costly occasion as 
the coronation, it could kind of clash, if you like. Um, so, you know, yeah, when Harry and Meghan come over to Frogmore Cottage, which they still lease uh, from, from the Crown Estates, who knows what they might do. So could some kind of deal be brokered? Now, it also talks about titles in the article. Now, we know uh, at the moment there have been no moves made by the king or the government to strip Harry of his dukedom or any of his other subsidiary titles. So could Harry, as part of this deal, kind of want an assurance that perhaps his titles are safe? Uh, in exchange for, you know, not being particularly high profile when he's over. There's also talk about, um, I suppose, Harry's place, Harry's placement, his seating at the event. Will it be a kind of a high profile position, positioning within the within Westminster Abbey? Uh, or will it be kind of towards the back, towards the side, where he's not going to be in much camera shot? Uh, will other members of the royal family want to be seen photographed with him are they going to be very cagey very careful about what they say to harry in case it ends up uh, on the pages of a future memoir uh, or even tv interview so you know there's lots and lots and lots and lots to think about um so the king is said to believe that harry and Meghan's absence at the coronation would be a greater distraction than their actual presence it is a hard thing to weigh up um and I've always said that kind of inviting them probably is the better option because then the honours is very much on Harry and Meghan and what they do. If they choose to come, then they'll be seen as, I suppose, supporting the, the monarchy, supporting the crown, supporting the institution, supporting his father. Um, and at the same time, almost kind of being seen to refuel a little bit of that royal magic a little bit of that royal mystique that they can then later go back to the US and try and capitalize on. So they'll get criticism if they go. If they don't go, then they'll also get criticism because it'll be seen as a snub to, to the institution of monarchy and his father. Plus, obviously, it's Archie's birthday. Uh, not that I think that that's an issue because actually I think having a coronation on your birthday is actually a really nice thing. I mean, it's very memorable. I don't think you'll, no matter how young you are, I don't think you'll forget the occasion that you attended a coronation or at least had a birthday uh, on the same day as your own grandfather's coronation. So I don't really think that's an issue. Um, but yeah, William is understood to be concerned that his brother will use the event to stage a stunt that would overshadow the event. Sources say Harry could be guaranteed a high profile seating position in the Abbey or an informal assurance that he will be able to keep his titles as an inducement to attend. However, William fears that unless Harry's visit is tightly scripted, he could steal the limelight by, for example, going on a walkabout in a deprived London borough with Meghan. One source said, the issue of substance is whether they attend the coronation and if they do, under what terms and conditions. The family is split and all the indications are that Harry is being advised to agree to nothing at this stage and play it right up to the last minute, which is making negotiations with him very difficult. Now, if that is true and Harry, you know, he's kind of holding back on the negotiation, trying to almost force the royal family's hand, that wouldn't be seen by the wider royal family as wanting to reconcile with them. So that kind of goes, you know, in contrast with what Harry has been saying in the TV interviews about wanting to reconcile. Harry's camp made clear that the idea that he would just attend the coronation and behave himself, but then be stripped of his titles was a total non-starter. This tells me that titles are important to Harry. When asked about would he give them up, he said, what difference would that make? In other words, a bit of a flippant answer. I think titles mean a lot to Harry. Um, Harry's position, his title, his style have, have been his life up until this point. And I don't think, I think he does hold a lot of stock by them. Uh, you know, he comes from an aristocratic family on both sides, the royal family and the Spencers, both aristocratic titled people and I think if it was taken away from him not just the Dukedom of Sussex but uh, the subsidiary titles 
I think it would hurt. And I think he would see that as a massive blow, not only to, um, to his own conscience, I suppose, and pride, but also to the marketability of the Sussex brand. And I think he knows that without those titles, without those connections, being shunned, being pushed back, not being included in the royal family would make it very difficult for his life. So while he might decide at some point to discard his titles of his own volition, he can do that. Um, he could choose to put them into abeyance, which means that they basically um, are just officially not used uh, until somebody comes forward to claim them. For example, um, when if Prince Harry passes away, um, Archie could come forward and claim those titles as his birthright. He resents being lumped together with Prince Andrew in the public mind as the two problem princes when he considers the circumstances to be totally different. The circumstances are different, I agree. Uh, I agree with him on that point. How Andrew and Harry got to the point where they're at is very different. But the situation that they both find themselves in is actually very similar. Um, how they find themselves at the moment is on the outskirts of the royal family and taking part in no royal life whatsoever. Both Harry and Andrew have had their military appointments and royal patronages, and any royal official links taken away. Um, they no longer receive funding from the monarchy. They no longer receive police protection. Um, so, you know, there are some similarities. And at some point, Andrew, if he remains in obscurity in the position that he's in will probably have to start making money himself um so they do find themselves in the same position but i do agree how they got there uh is very very different last night both lambeth palace and buckingham palace declined to comment while a source close to prince william said they were not aware of any such negotiations over the coronation so officially there has been a denial about these stories. Harry's representatives did not respond to a request for comment. Um, so yes, um, <laughs> and yeah, we're in that kind of situation where we're having leaks coming forward and but official denials. So do take all of this with a pinch of salt. But what is, I, I think, pretty safe to say is that there is going to have to be some kind of negotiation going forward what will harry's involvement be where will he sit uh, what will he do while he's back in the uk around the time is he planning a stunt let me know in the comment section below what you think about all this by the way i'm wearing one of my new tiaras today if you haven't seen my unboxing video just go and check it i'll, I'll leave it linked this is the honeysuckle tiara uh, the gloucester honeysuckle tiara it's gorgeous uh, and I, I know you can't see it much because of my hair, but I'll try and tilt it back. Um, so yeah, if you want to see that video of me unboxing four new tiaras, then do go and check that out. Um, right. Also, Charles has been out today. Now, he has made a point, I think, of being seen at church every Sunday uh, for many, many, many weeks now. And what's interesting to me is that he's been seen at Sandringham. So he is using it. He's using it. It is a private residence, a private uh, royal estate. Um, so it doesn't have any official connections. It doesn't have to be used for any official state business. It's a family home. And, you know, it's unclear uh, whether or not there was rumours going around about Balmoral. Will it be turned into a museum uh, based on Queen Elizabeth? Because uh, visitors can visit Balmoral uh, out of season when the royals aren't there. Um, they, they can't go in all of the rooms, uh, mostly the gardens and a few rooms if you're lucky. Uh, and you can, you can, of course, pay to stay in some of the lodges um, that the estate has, uh, some of them really close to Balmoral Castle itself. But so far, we haven't seen any signs of that. And as I've said previously, Balmoral is pretty much a museum to Queen Victoria. Um, a lot of the, the furniture and the furnishings, the decoration is all Queen Victoria. So really, having Balmoral as an, an ode to Queen Elizabeth is not really in my mind, it's more an ode to Queen Victoria, let's put it that way. So for me, that idea is out, and we haven't seen any movement on that. Sandringham, again, a private home. Um, it looks like Charles has been using it quite a lot at weekends at least, because we've seen him out at church. 
Um, Princess Anne has been seen with him this week. I think it's really good that brother and sister, the elder brother and sister, because of course Queen Elizabeth's family was kind of split into kind of two halves. Of course, you've got Charles and Anne, and then you've got Andrew and Edward, the kind of second part of the family, so to speak. Um, so I think it's really good that the older the older siblings are sticking together. Princess Anne is worth her weight in gold. Uh, she she rarely has ever, I don't think, put a foot wrong. Yes, she's gone through her own private family issues, divorce, um, but she always steers and finds a way to navigate a path without causing a fuss. She, she just gets on with it. She doesn't care about the glory. She doesn't really care about the pomp. She just gets on with what she sees as her role and her duty. And I think lots of royals, <laughs> young and old, uh, could probably take a leaf out of Princess Anne's book. Now, I love the fact she's wearing uh, a hat. Now, I don't know if it's real fur or not. Um, I know a lot of the royals have been kind of throwing it or discarding their furs and replacing them with uh, with faux. So I, I can't quite tell, looking at the photo, whether or not that's a faux hat. It does look quite an old one. We know that Princess Anne recycles a lot of her clothes, rewears them uh, quite frequently. So don't know about the fur, but she's wearing a gorgeous scarf. The king and Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, are both kind of matching with their shades of brown. The king looks really good. I love his coat and, of course, his umbrella with that wooden handle. Um, Princess Anne wearing, like, a check trouser. Uh, she always looks good in trousers, and she's teamed it with what looks like boots with heels. So she's looking... I mean, she's giving me part Rupert Bear vibes, but I'm loving it. I'm here for it. I'm loving the fashion. Um, and it just goes to show how close brother and sister are and what a key uh, member of the royal family Charles um, holds in, in Princess Anne, his sister. And this goes to, uh, goes to show me, and it tells a tale on actually how a spare, uh, although Princess Anne you know, technically isn't, wasn't Charles' spare, uh, but it just goes to show how a member of the family that's a sibling can actually have an entire royal career all the way through their life and still be immensely popular, hardworking, dutiful and valued by the monarch. No matter you know how the positions change, doesn't matter how far Princess Anne has been pushed down the line of succession, she is still up there. She's doing her thing. She's doing her work. She's, she's serving her country. She's serving her monarch, who happens to be her brother. And she's highly valued and held incredibly high in public esteem. I think there's a few royals that can take note of how to handle being the spare or a spare from Princess Anne. And I hope that the rumours or the stories are true that Princess Charlotte and of course Prince Louis are being brought up in the same kind of mould as Princess Anne. I can definitely see a touch of the Princess Anne's in Charlotte. I don't know what it is yet um but i can definitely see a strong will i think in charlotte and i think that comes through uh, from the duke of edinburgh's side so to speak and even the queen i suppose as well very dutiful people and i think you know charlotte and louis are going to be okay um so yes and then the, that particular article just goes on talking about um charles oh oh Lady Susan Hussey, let me get there. So Lady Susan Hussey was in attendance at the church service as well. And it's kind of good to see her back. Um, I think a lot of people feel that she was a scapegoat under a big misunderstanding that happened, where, of course, she had to resign from her honorary position. Um, of course, she was a former lady-in-waiting to the Queen. Then the King kind of kept kept on the existing ladies-in-waiting in a different capacity because, of course, Camilla has her own Queen's companions. So Lady Susan Hussey at Sandringham, possibly she's been staying as a guest of Charles and Camilla, still goes to show that she is held in high esteem within the royal family. In fact, even William and Harry of both, you know, really kind of shone praises upon Lady Susan Hussey. I think, you know, all of this, all of the furore that came out over uh, what she said at the palace reception, 
um, has come as a great surprise to a lot of people that, that know her, which kind of leads me to think that perhaps it was just an incredibly big misunderstanding. Um, and, and I think she probably was a bit of a scapegoat for all of it. So is she being brought back into the royal fold? Was she ever out of the royal fold? I don't think she was. Um, could she perhaps, you know, have her position back? It, you know, it doesn't look like she wants to step back quietly and never ever be seen again and just go into a complete obscurity. So it was nice to see her smiling, chatting, talking to, to the crowds, carrying bunches of flowers that have been passed. Um, so it's not even clear whether or not she may have actually been there on an, an official capacity to aid uh, King Charles. Who knows? On my list, and I can't believe I'm actually even even having that. I'm even here discussing this because okay, cash your mind back to a few days ago last week. It came out that uh, Prince Andrew sources for Prince Andrew had said that something was coming out in February that was going to you know kind of change the minds of of everyone, kind of basically get him off the hook. And we were all wondering what 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 is it? Did he finally find? the the receipt from from pizza express i mean you know what could it possibly be that was going to exonerate him and rehabilitate his image in the eyes of the public um but it turns out what we actually got and i think this is the actual thing that he was referring to i'm kind of hoping it's not because it's it's pretty pathetic let's put it that way um so yes uh, a maxwell of course Ghislaine maxwell family bathroom stunt is said to prove Prince Andrew's innocence is shameful, uh, say friends of his accuser, Virginia Roberts. So yes, basically, if it is true, the piece of information that came out is a photo released by Ghislaine's friends or family from her townhouse um, in the bathtub that supposedly Andrew and Ghislaine had a romantic linking to i don't know what what you want to call it but anyway that's where apparently things that were said to have happened um and yeah i think what they're trying to say from this photo is that there's not enough room in there to do anything untoward but from my understanding virginia didn't actually even say that they had those sorts of relations in the bathtub we're not even clear whether it's the same bathtub i mean you know how many years ago was it bathrooms get refitted that may not even be the same you know bathroom suite who knows um but she as far as my understanding is concerned said that perhaps there was some some foreplay some toe sucking or something in the bathtub before moving on into the bedroom um and i think she said that she was doing her best to seduce him all the rest of it i think those are her words from her from an earlier book or an interview or something um so there is no, as far as I'm concerned, actual claims that, you know, phys physicality, you know what I'm trying to say, happened in the bathtub. But Ghislaine's family and friends are trying to prove that it's impossible and therefore that she's lying and therefore trying to discredit her um, by showing two people in the bathtub with, rather strangely, a kind of photograph of Ghislaine and Andrew in there. Now, the photograph doesn't really disprove or prove anything it just shows two people in a bathtub um <laughs> with masks on so if this is the information that prince andrew hoped was going to exonerate him that he was going to you know sue sue her for to get oh yeah that was the other part of the story was that he wanted to get back the money that he settled with with her for uh, of course that happened at the time of the platinum jubilee and he claims uh, through sources that he felt railroaded and pressure, pressurised into settling because of the timing uh, not to overshadow the Queen's Jubilee. Now, estimations of how much he paid have never been confirmed fully, but they ranged all the way up to 13 million. It's believed now it was closer to the 3 million mark. That's the mark that I'm seeing banded around quite a bit. Now, I'm assuming the reason why the newspapers have settled upon three million is because the same sources that are revealing that prince andrew wants to sue and wants to exonerate his name that information's coming out 
have probably leaked that it was more in the region of three million. So Andrew buoyed by perhaps some inheritance from his mother, the late queen, may have some renewed funds to be able to you know, fund uh, legal action against Virginia if he so wish. So we're not going to get into the whys and what falls and the morals and the legalities of it, but we are going to talk um, about the fact that this is just crazy. This is just absolute. That photo does not prove or disprove anything. In fact, it's it's just weird. It is just really, 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 really uh, strange. And apparently, a source connected to Miss Roberts, uh, who now goes by the name of, of course, Dufresne. Uh, said that if this shameful stunt is the best Maxwell's side can do in defence of Prince Andrew, then it's laughable. Uh, it's a disgusting attempt to discredit a victim of sexual abuse and would be uh, risible if it were not so offensive. Plus, uh, they have their facts totally wrong. Virginia never said that they had sex in the bathtub. Um, lawyer Lisa Bloom uh, said that what a surreal, bizarre photograph, it proves nothing. I mean, I have to agree. But even the photograph, um, oh yeah, Virginia said that she and Andrew then moved into the bedroom uh, where the activity occurred. Um, but even the photo of Andrew and Virginia just standing side by side with his arm round um, apparently has been proved to be a real photo, uh, not doctored. That photo in itself doesn't actually prove anything. It just proves that, that they met. Um, it doesn't prove that anything beyond meeting happened. It just proves also that perhaps Andrew is lying about it. Anyway, uh, I just think if that photograph is the thing that Andrew thinks is going to uh, improve his situation, it absolutely 100% is not. Then we move on to Prince Andrew is ready to sue for $100 million if Virginia repeats her claims against him in her upcoming book. So Virginia is um, going to have a book coming out, we do believe, um, and we don't know what's going to be in it. In it, she is expected to talk about her experiences and, of course, her life. Now, if, if Prince Andrew is worried about what she's going to say, it goes to tell me that the settlement that he that he settled with um, legally at the time of the Jubilee celebrations did not have a clause, like a gagging clause in. And I don't know why you would pay three million for something that you say you didn't do if then you don't actually put a gagging clause in. I don't know if that was a sticking point in negotiations or not, whether or not you know she stood by the fact that she wanted to be able to say whatever she wanted. I don't know. Um, I think there was like a six month gagging clause, but a six, a six month gagging clause means absolutely nothing because six months is, is of course soon up. So it just goes to show, I mean, that was a bad deal. If he's paid three million pounds um, and then she can still say whatever she wants, that's not a particularly good deal anyway. Prince Andrew is ready to launch $100 million lawsuit against his accuser, if she repeats the claims. Uh, legal sources close to the prince uh, have consulted US lawyers in a bid to overturn a settlement he reached with Miss Roberts last year, say he will go on the attack should she repeat the allegations. Um, apparently his uh, high-powered lawyers are Andrew uh, Brettler and Blair Burke uh, for an attempt to get Miss Roberts to retract any claims and possibly secure an apology from her. Last night, a source familiar with the case told uh, that the minute she writes anything that repeats the original claims against him, she will be hit with a $100 million, which is £81 million, defamation lawsuit. Andrew and his lawyers are ready to go on the attack. Then her claims will be put under scrutiny for the first time in a court of law. Now, it seems to me that that's all what Virginia has ever wanted was for you know things to be put... Um, to be heard in a court of law. And it also goes to show, I think, how confident Andrew is looking to be. He's either, he's either blagging it, um, sort of calling her bluff, or he's you know pretty certain that she doesn't have any actual evidence of any wrongdoing. Uh, so in a court of law, it would just, I suppose, come down to who the, the jury and the judge believe. Um, but 
you know, to believe, you have to have it based on evidence. And I, I've always felt that had there been hard evidence of any wrongdoing, that that would have been brought rather than a settlement. It would probably have gone to a legal case or, or, or both. I mean, you could have had the, um, the, the criminal, a criminal case heard, uh, decided upon if you were confident that you had the evidence, and then you could have sued for damages. Um, so I think Andrew's people are probably thinking that there isn't anything and that it's the only way of him getting back any kind of reputation. So I think that's where we're at. Basically, if, if she says anything in a book or an interview, then there is probably going to be some kind of, of lawsuit. Now, of course, we don't, well, Andrew doesn't want any of this kind of going on at the time of the coronation. We don't, of course, know Andrew's own level of involvement in the coronation, um, looking very doubtful that he'll be up front and centre, let's put it that way. Um, so that's kind of those weird stories done for now. Um, now, of course, the other royals, the other working royals, William and Kate, have still been working and carrying on. Uh, of course, Catherine working very much with the early years of childhood development. And she did share, the Princess of Wales shared a teaser video of a scrapbook ahead of a launch of an early years campaign to give young children the best start in life. The Princess of Wales is promoting her new early childhood campaign, which aims to give generations of children the best start in life. She posted a video to Twitter, teasing the campaign launch after she met her team of advisors on the subject for the first time earlier this week. Uh, the Royals meeting came as Kensington Palace said that Kate's work through her Royal Foundation Centre for Early Childhood to promote the importance of the first five years of a child's life is being accelerated. Uh, full details of the new campaign were not given, but Catherine told the advisors she was excited about the project and said that a key area that might be looked into is how to develop the social and emotional skills which are vital for later life. And I think that, you know, Catherine has really latched on to something here. You know, basically she's saying, look, mental health issues do not start, I mean, some do, some people have trauma later in life, but a lot of people's, you know, issues on also how you are able to deal with traumas that you might sustain later in life. It all happens in the early stages of development. And if you can give children a really good grounding in themselves, their values, their beliefs, how to deal with difficult things that might arise in your life, of course, age appropriately, then it puts you in a much better stead for later in life when you do come across um, hardships. So Catherine says, I am really excited for next week. There is lots coming out. We're really excited to hear it. Uh, and today I just want to think about and discuss what next, really. How do we keep this conversation going? This campaign's really to try and raise the awareness of the importance of this issue and its sort of what we can do to collectively to keep the conversation going and what we do next. Uh, it's about what helps shape us, what shapes our relationships and the emotional experience of childhood and about creating the building blocks and the scaffolding for how we first start to understand ourselves and others. These are really complicated big issues to look at, but I think from the centre's point of view, one of the main key areas is how do we develop the social and emotional skills which are vital in later life? How do we better manage and regulate our emotions? How do we build better relationships? And I think that is absolutely key and vital um, in having you know, full, sustained uh, lives where we are happy, where we're happy uh, and you know, we are being valued as well as we are valuing other people. And I think that uh, most definitely helps everyone's mental health. So thank you for watching this video. I do hope that you have enjoyed it. If you found it useful, then please give it a big old thumbs up. Don't forget, of course, to share on social media. And of course, do hit the bell so that you know whenever I upload a new video. So from me, to you all, and goodbye.